Okay, as the credits roll by. Hi, my name is Pete Hammond, and I'm going to moderate tonight. And I hope you all enjoyed 1917. Is this an amazing movie? This is an amazing movie, and you are so lucky to be here tonight that we are so happy here at Landmark Theaters and, and Universal Pictures making this possible. Uh, first off, I want to introduce you to the two stars of the film. Dean Charles Chapman, right here. <laughs> <laughs> and George Mackay. <laughs> and he's such an extraordinary director. This actually is the first screenplay he's also written, too, and he did a great job with this with his co-writer. Uh, an Academy Award winning director of so many great movies. Please welcome Sam Mendes. Hi. Well, this, this movie, when I, I've seen it more than once now. Um, I actually saw it for the second time here. Uh, you know, I just said uh, they were having a little event, and I said, I want to stay and watch this again. This is a movie you can see so many different things when you see it multiple times. And I'm suggesting that you keep coming back. Um, Sam, how did this idea come about? Because this is the first time you've actually worked as a screenwriter on one of your films, too. Yeah, I guess I just wanted to make the journey between my head and the audience as short as possible. <laughs> I, I know that sounds kind of banal in a way, but it, sometimes as a director, you, you know, it, it, it feels like you're having to explain yourself the whole time to writers. And because the nature of this movie is in many ways non-verbal, there's not a huge amount of dialogue. A lot of it is image. Right. And because I wanted to write something that I knew was two hours of real time, and, and ultimately, very quickly after that, I decided it would be one shot. So I, I felt like I was capable of writing this. Perhaps a more complex screenplay, layered, subplots, that sort of thing. I would have felt a little bit more hesitant. But I, I just felt like I, I had it in me to, to put this down. And it was also partly that <coughs> it was based on, as you saw from the dedication at the end, it's based on uh, stories my grandfather, Alfred Mendes, told us. And, you know, he fought in the war from 1916 to 1918. He enlisted as a 17-year-old. And um, uh, he told nobody of what happened to him uh, until he was in his 70s. And it was us. It was his grandchildren that he told. So for me, it was very personal. Wow, yeah. um, and I felt that somehow I, I owed it to him to try and retell the stories in my way, even though it's not really about him. The, 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 he told one story about carrying a message across no man's land that was the starting point for the movie. Um, but then the movie we, the, the story we created was entirely different. So George is not playing my grandfather, but right. it, the movie would not have happened without my grandfather. He was, it was because of him that I wrote it and because of the stories that he told us. This is, uh, yeah, you can applaud that, absolutely. <laughs> well, it's a great tribute to him, whether it's his exact story or not. It is the story of many, I think, here. And um, I was at an event here. Steven Spielberg's involved in this film, DreamWorks, who I think he uh, said their very first Oscar was American Beauty, uh, his company uh, that you directed. And um, he was talking about this film and, and really, like, relating to it. But he said it was brought to him by you, and, um, and he said, yeah, I read the script and everything, and then you said something to him, and said, oh, by the way, I want to do it in one shot. And he goes, what? It's like a <laughs> epic. This is not Birdman. This is... <laughs> <laughs> it, was that what happened? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, yeah, I... I uh, <clears throat> the thing is, I felt like I wanted to trap the audience with the characters. <laughs> uh, and, and I know that sounds, again, quite simplistic, but y you know, you, you begin to, w once you begin to intuit, even if you're not consciously thinking this is one shot, you begin to feel that like you're not gonna cut. 
you begin to experience time as the characters are experienced time they're experiencing time you begin to experience distance in the way that they do physical difficulty in the way that they do and for me with these boys i was encouraging them to live it as much as to act it and and so it seemed like a natural way to do it if we could yeah. then of course you've got to get a master cinematographer and roger deakins to my mind is one of the one or two greatest living cinematographers who you've worked with a few times and i had worked with him and i and i felt like although roger stylistically is not given to using a lot of moving camera shots so i knew it would be quite a challenge <laughs> for him yeah. um he thinks in in quite static images sometimes he likes storyboarding um but but i felt like <clears throat> i just i don't know i felt from the very beginning that was how we should tell the story and once I'd explained it, I mean, I, I think as a director, you have to answer the, ask the question, answer the question why a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, ma in many ways, it's your biggest job. Yeah. W well, why do you want me to play this part? Well, here, here's why. Why do you want me to write this script? W why are we setting it in the casino? Why are we going to this country? Why are we doing it here? And, you know, the, the, there was a big why that we ha I had to answer f f straight off here. So Spielberg said, well, why one shot? And I gave him a version of what I've just given you, maybe a little longer and a little bit more complex. But that was it. And, you know, a lot of directing is explaining w what you need and, w and, w and why it has to be that way. Um, you know, being a director, <coughs> there's nothing, I don't have a certificate, right, that says I am a director. <laughs> Th these gentlemen have trained, you know, they've been to drama school and I did no training, <laughs> you know. I just <laughs> called myself a director and then have to persuade everyone else that that's in fact the case. And then made a movie and won an Oscar on your first well, time out. Yeah, but that was after 15 years of working in the theater. So <laughs> it's slightly different, you know. Uh, but anyway, so for me, it was just another, uh, you know, when someone like Steven says, why, and you convince him, then if you think, well, I can convince Spielberg, I, I can convince anyone. You know what interests me, what you just said? But I was a theater director for 15 years. And this movie definitely needs a theater director for a lot of what you're doing, those sustained shots and everything else. A lot of it is theater. Well, it's theater in the sense that, you know, I'm very used to putting together a two-hour story with no edits, yeah. uh, which has an internal rhythm, you know, it has a shape to it, uh, momentum, uh, ebbs and flows, it breathes in and breathes out, and without recourse to editing. Yeah. So for me, to tell a story to an audience for two hours without cutting, is that's very normal. On the other hand, this is completely unlike theatre in many ways, in all, in all the other ways. It's very cinematic, it's constantly in motion, you're dealing with the, the natural world. The relationship between the camera and the actors, the characters, is constantly changing, unlike in, the, in, in a, in a theatre. Um, you know, we were looking for a style, this dance of the camera and the characters that was sometimes able to be very intimate, and other times very epic. Uh, was a able to establish geography and we're basically trying to use all the established parts of film grammar yeah. you know you cut wide for geography you cut tight for emotion <laughs> you know but but without editing um, and and I think that's what we spend most time doing and, and one of the wonderful things was you know was having two young actors who were committed so 100% passionate and committed to it for months before we even started shooting I said to them before we started you know, it's less of a job, it's more of a lifestyle choice, this, right? <laughs> You're gonna be spend spending six months living this before we even roll camera on it. And they did, you know, they lived it, they went to France and Belgium to do their research, they spent their lives in these uniforms with their weapons, because uh, we had to start with them walking on empty fields, and only when we measured the exact number of steps they took and the exact route they would take, could we start to build the sets. So we started with them with scripts and just walking with them and we planted flags in the ground and then we started digging the trenches and we dug over a mile of trenches and filled them with people and then we yeah, went Dennis Gastner's production design is extraordinary and, and people don't realize that is production design that absolutely. whole thing you're looking at in the fields and all of that yeah yeah absolutely I mean and, and you know <laughs> thank you and you've got no man's land and you've got yeah. <laughs> you've got tra you know a natural natural world that's actually designed so you've got, you know, woods and orchards and farmhouses. They weren't there. There was just empty fields. So, <laughs> and I'm saying, you know, we planted wood. I mean, you know, that th those are all uh, strategically placed de depending on what was necessary for each particular scene. And, you know, something as simple as an orchard, you know, they have a c the boys have a conversation in the orchard. It has to be exactly the length of the scene. Mm -hmm. It can't be any, any longer. It can't be any shorter. If it's any shorter, 
they have to go so slowly it seems unrealistic. Uh, in terms of walking, if it's any longer, they have 100 yards still to go before the end, you know, and the dialogue was run out. But that, for me, that started, I, I worked that out when we did Skyfall, if, you, if any of the people in here saw that, Javier Bardem's first speech is one shot, and we constructed the set on, uh, on stage at Pinewood to be the exact length of the speech. Um, so it started with me actually walking up and down in an empty studio and working out how at the speed at which I thought he would be moving and then building the set for the speech. And that set me thinking, well, if I can do that, maybe we can build an entire journey for a script. So everything came from these guys. Everything came from, in from inside out. And in that respect, it's also like the theater. Isn't that amazing? They're probably shocked to hear that this all started with a James Bond movie. <laughs> <laughs> These two actors are extraordinary. I really. <laughs> uh, how did the casting process come about, and how did you come upon them here? They just wandered in one day. <laughs> I, I've seen George in yeah. uh, Captain Fantastic, which yeah. a, a movie I absolutely love. Yeah. And, um, and he was one of the kids in that, but you know, and, and, and Dean uh, also has been in many things, but um, putting them together in this kind of situation. Well, they had, you know, the usual, it's the usual thing, isn't it? You, you send them pages, you can't send them the whole script because, you know, it's confidential and you don't want people knowing the story and you're meeting hundreds of young actors. Um, and they did that thing that you hope for as a director. They came in and they were the roles you'd imagined and something more. They were better than what you'd imagine. They, they, they brought something indefinable, and then you put them together and you get that nice two plus two equals five, you know, and that even they are unaware uh, of, of what they bring as a, as a pair, but they were complementary. I, I wanted someone old-fashioned and internal for Schofield, perhaps a little bit more middle class, been out there longer, obviously has a family, um, and, and uh, very um, dignified in a way, and, and a poet on some level. Um, and then I wanted someone who was a chirpy, chatty, talkative, <laughs> you know, a bit Larry. I mean, my joke about with the two of them was that if they were in the pub, they would be in different parts of the pub. They wouldn't necessarily be talking to each other. <laughs> He'd be by the, Schofield would be by the fire with his book in his gla uh. glass of wine and, and <laughs> do his dog at his feet and he'd be with his mates over at the bar on his third pint making jokes about girls, you know. <laughs> and that, that, that was, and that they would, but in war, you know, those two people are, are become friends. It's an unlikely friendship and they don't even know really why they love each other, but they do. And that sort of also happened, I think, you know, they can talk to this, but they, they, it happened off, off screen as well. Um, that they became friends and I was able then to have that luxury you want as a director of just watching them uh, interact themselves and, and begin to see how I could take what they were giving me and, f and, and feed that into the, part, the parts as well. So in a way they became almost their own authors at times even though they were unaware of it. Amazing. George, what was this like working in this kind of role which I think is, I'm going to guess, probably unlike anything you've done before? in movies. Yeah, completely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, it's almost unlike anything anybody's done before in movies. It's, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's, it's because of the process. I think it's the process of this, of this film and, um, and being involved f from, from such an early, early point and, uh, and, but being involved with everyone. I think that's the biggest thing that I've taken from it in, in terms of obviously it's a very sort of personal experience and as Sam said, I think I like I, I feel very close to S Schofield as a as a character or, or would like to be but you know that there, there, there's a sort of I don't know I, f I I just felt close to the part but it's um what what I learned most was I think sometimes as as an actor like there's this kind of fabled idea that the more in your own head you are with something and it's kind of quite a separate experience so even if you kind of are working on it for months beforehand you you yourself are working on it where with this it was a much more three-dimensional process and getting to understand how you're, you were, you know, as you always are with the storytelling, you're like a cog in a bigger machine that is the story and, and just being much more aware of all the other cogs was really healthy and really beneficial and how you can all facilitate each other and, uh, and, and work with each other. And 
that yeah that's a pr like a process i've never had before sometimes some jobs have been intense in a more singular way sometimes they've been very collaborative but therefore s slightly vague where this was this was just a this was just perfect <laughs> you know? yeah i mean just the level of choreography involved in these performances and all those scenes and everything has to be timed like he's saying Seems extraordinary if you're an actor and you're trying to put all that emotion and everything that you do into this. It's really a great performance that you give here and that you give here too. I gotta say, Dean, that death scene that you have, I'm a connoisseur of death scenes in movies. <laughs> and it took me back to a picture called Sometimes a Great Notion with Paul Newman and this actor named Richard Jekyll who was slowly dying, going underwater, uh, cut uh, uh, under a log. And I'm watching you do this and it is flawless I, it's really <laughs> i haven't seen this that much and i you know that scene has to be incredibly emotional to play and to get to that point where you can do this it was it was um <clears throat> i mean firstly i love that scene especially how it's written you know some of the stuff that blake says in his dying moments really are touching even just reading the script you know that when he Blake says am I dying you know or will you write to my mum for me things like that just get you um, but it was a scene that we I mean we rehearsed it we rehearsed it once really in a, a rehearsal room months before we actually got to shooting on, on that day um, and I remember like the first time we actually did it and I couldn't stop crying and that scene was how long was it Sam? About eight minutes, something eight and a half minutes. Eight minutes but long. One, was, I mean, the, the the single take was eight eight minutes, and he did it. I don't know, twenty times. He died twenty times. Died. <laughs> died. <laughs> I just couldn't finish him off. You know. No. Still <laughs> him back again. But um, it was. I mean, really, this this whole experience making a film, you know, like with eight minute long takes, you really do get completely lost in the scene. And especially when you're dying, you know, I genuinely believed I was dying. You know, I genuinely believed I was in no man's land. I genuinely believed everything we did. It never, it, as Sam said, you know, it was lived rather than, uh, you know, it was very lived. You know, there's a, there's a, there was another thing with that scene, which is that he had a rig on himself. Uh, uh, he had to bleed, obviously, during the shot. And so we had to work out how to do that without, without cutting, without visual effects. A lot of it, the effects were in camera. So he had a little pump. He had the blood bag was in his kit, right. you know, his backpack, and he had a little pump that made a little sort of tiny little ee noise. <laughs> and uh, it p so when he took his, when he opened his jacket, his, his tunic, and saw himself bleeding out, uh, he was watching his own body pumping blood. I mean, it was quite, w wasn't it? I mean, you, you, and the look on your face, I think it's one of the, my favorite pieces of acting in the movie, just the, l the way in which you, you 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 react when you see your own blood. That's and that's the sort of thing that you know it took us weeks to work out how to do it, and we tested different rigs and constructed things. But when you get it right, it allows the actor an incredible freedom, you know, because they're just that is just pumping blood the whole time. The feeling that there's more and more and more and more coming into your own hands, soaking your clothes, soaking your trousers. That's real. And at the end of every take, obviously, you have to go off. He has to shower, you know, change his clothes, and back in an hour or forty-five minutes. But that sort of thing. And then each time the adrenaline starts surging again, he's got to do it again. He's got to, you know, it's all going to happen. It's going to happen for real. So that's the way in which it can change the way an actor can actually create something on screen. Film generally is very fragmented. It's very broken up. And it's very inorganic, you know, it, do, it doesn't, you never, nothing ever flows in the way that, I mean, when you see it, it flows, you know. I mean, the ultimate of that is an action, any action scene in a normal movie it is incredibly tedious to shoot and then thrilling, hopefully, to watch, <laughs> right? Um, and, but most acting is, you know, is just very, you know, if you had, for example, Andrew Scott's scene in, the, in, in this movie, so he plays Lieutenant Leslie, the guy they meet early on who says they're idiots for going over into no man's right. land otherwise known as the sexy priest from Fleabag. Yes. <coughs> he and my wife loves this yeah. guy. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's not alone. Anyway, so uh, we all love him too. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> but you know, he did he did I don't know fifty six takes of this scene, right? And you know, at least twenty of them are like, oh my god, the lighter broke, or there's <laughs> a cigarette wooden light, or he, he someone missed a line, or he couldn't get his f- flare gun into his pocket, <laughs> or you know whatever Pops. that sort of stuff. And it, it was a heavy day, right? And uh, maybe take fifty two was the one that you see. By that time, he he himself it was almost second nature. But it, had we done that in a conventional way, in a conventional movie way splitting it up into setups. He's moving from an interior to an exterior. There would have been many setups. He'd probably been shooting for two and a half to three days, just that one scene. And we did it in a day. Now, it was intense, and it was ext- an extreme, you know, seven, eight minutes, whatever it was. Um, but actually, in many cases, it was shorter, but it needs you to prep it a lot beforehand. So we were rehearsing all those trench scenes and all those interiors in interior I- on stages at Shepperton, and we constructed all the trenches in out of piles of cardboard boxes, so that we could move. I could move the walls to make them exactly the right size before the design department started to construct it. So I, I was wor- I had to have Andrew Scott and the boys do that scene and work out. You know how big the where the bed was, uh, what how wide the door was, and Roger could come in and we could shoot it with a silly little camera and work out what the moves were, and we could also cut into the trench sides the space for the camera operator to move, because there were three performers going the whole time, the two that you see and the one that you don't see, yeah. and that route also had to be very specifically planned, but the challenge of the movie was always the precision of the camera with the freedom and the spontaneity of performance. You don't want performances to become robotic and and repetitive in the wrong way, but you do want the camera to be absolutely doing exactly inch for inch exactly what you want. So that weird combination was always a balance that we were trying to try to that's why I, I'm going to get some questions from the audience, but it's an extraordinary. I could go on forever asking these questions, but it's an extraordinary cinematic thing. I was we were in an event today where they showed a scene from the film, and I'm watching it with the plane coming in, and when the plane goes down, I'm going like, okay, this time it's not coming back. <laughs> you know, movies can do that, and you watch that again, and I had the same feeling. I've seen it before. I've seen it in clips. I've seen it in the movie. And every time it gets me, it's just extraordinary what you guys have done with this film. So let's see what you thought of it. Yes, sir, right there. So thank you so much for making this movie. It's one of my favorite of the years by far. It is genius. So my question is, George, you went through so many of the finest British actors through this film. It was like these like <laughs> landmarks. You know, you had Colin Firth, Andrew Scott, you know, Benedict Cumberbatch, and Mark Strong. Did you learn anything from them as you went to these different landmarks? I feel like they must have bestowed something on you. Because it was so amazing. <laughs> it's actually, about, actually, it's an interesting question because you do have an incredible supporting cast that probably came in for a couple of days, you know, to do a scene or two, and, uh, and then we're gone. And uh, these guys are carrying the entire film. But what did you learn from working with this great cast? It yeah, was it was it was a real <laughs> privilege, you know. It's as you say, they're like English milestones. <laughs> like, um, uh, but it was. I think the thing that they're all very like different in in their way. But the the, the unifying thing that that I I felt with all of them is the specificity of all of their work, and and it kind of they'll come at it in different ways. But it's the the detail with which they approach and perform a scene. <laughs> And sometimes it's like un- unconscious, but it's the, the for some it's the way that you can pull out a word or a syllable and you can kind of juice the language. Because some some of them done, well, all of them have done done theatre and done such great work in theatre. And the way that they can use language to kind of get their points across, as well as just inter- interrogating the um, the complexities of the scene. Like as as Sam was always keen to have the. What could be archetypal figures of these officers? Often, you know, you know, the bad, upper class, mindless blokes sending these, you know, poor kind of every man over the top. It was it. It wasn't a case. Everyone is trying to do the best with the information and the experience that they have, and so you know, to 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 meet them and um, and these actors crafting their characters and the experience that they've decided that those men have had. And the and the information that they've decided that they they know, 
it was really amazing to see kind of how they interrogated that and um, to pull apart and without it ever being vague as well, but to kind of offer up everything and being so skilled at nailing all of those complexities that they've found within it. So I think the specificity of their work and the detail. Um, yes, way up there. Yep, that's you. Hi. Hi. Um, how in the world did you edit this movie? I know there's a ton of um, there's a ton of takes what, in here. What editing? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how did he edit? He didn't edit it. It's a guy named Lee Smith, who's an incredible editor, uh, Dunkirk, and many other things. And yeah, the, well, talk the, about the editing here, because people don't think it's edited. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's edited. Well, it depends on what you mean by edited. This is the thing. Uh, yeah, in technical terms, it's several long takes strung together. There are points where one shot is blended with another. Sometimes it's a stitch, sometimes it's a blend, sometimes it's a morph. Sometimes it's literally a simple foreground wipe. Someone walks across the frame, and on one side is the A side of the shot, and the, you know, the, 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 the one take, and on the other side of the wipe is another take. And that as, they work, what, as the person crosses frame, it's just like a wipe. So sometimes it's very, very simple, and it's really straightforward. Uh, at other times, even filmmakers who, you know, who, uh, <laughs> friends of mine, like, how the fuck did you do that? <laughs> yeah. You know, what, where, what, with the plane crash, for example, yeah. I mean, people who, you know, wh <laughs> what point does it become real? You know, oh, I'm not going to tell you, but <laughs> I will reveal here, actually, there's a, there's ah. a, well, there's a slight, it's sleight of hand, really. It's, it's partly, you know, it's a visual effect. That's a, so it's a CG plane until a certain point, and then it, it's taken over by a practical rig. So we blend between CG and a practical, or in the practical plane, crashes through a barn, uh, run on a track, and, and I learned that trick from Skyfall. We ran a, we ran a, uh, the, the tube crash in Skyfall, which is a practical effect. Um, but as George stands up in the foreground, as they both run to the plane, Dean goes the other side of George, and George fi forms the foreground wipe. So we just duck but round behind, and as we come out the other side, we're on a real, we're, we're the real plane, we're real real flames and what have you. So uh, I don't expect you to understand it entirely, but the, but the thing about an editor is there's a great David Mamet line about editing. He, he says in the, in the editing room, the director is serving two masters, the movie and himself. It's the editor's job to just serve the movie. And for, for me, the, the editor is the conscience of the film. You know, he's the person who sits there and, and, and has the balls to tell the director, you know what, that's boring or that doesn't work or that doesn't make sense to me or I think that takes better than that take and in this case Lee who as Pete said you know he's just won the Oscar for Dunkirk but it's you know all Chris Nolan's movies you know brilliantly edited by Lee he's a superb editor and it was it was almost comic that I was asking him to take this movie on <laughs> with no obvious cuts right? <laughs> but every day he was analyzing what we shot and he was we were having to make the decision what take we would use on that day so he w he was telling me look i know uh, uh, director's instinct is if you've done let's say 28 takes you almost always go for take 28 27 or 26 basically as long as they're not uh, uh you know uh problematic but he didn't want to know he never wants to know what my favorite takes are and he would often say to me look i know you like tw take 27 but look at take 12 you know george fluffs a little line there but we can deal with that I think that's the best take, and this is why. And he was almost always right. So he was he was stopping me from always going to the obvious solutions. Mm -hmm. He was putting music on. He was putting sound together. He was stitching it together and feeding it back to me straight away so I could begin to judge whether I could take the time I needed to take for the next section of the film because this movie was emerging out of the mist very, very quickly. And... Um, so, for example, a scene like the scene where George comes up the slope into the singing soldier, you know, the soldiers are all in the woods towards the end there. That takes a long time. I wanted it to take a long time, but I needed, in a way, it's much, it's much more difficult to summon up the courage to do a scene like that in a movie like this than it is a big action sequence or, or big explosions or because it needed to take its time. And I had the courage to do it at that tempo because I'd seen the movie up to that point. Mm. Everything was stitched together. We shot mostly in sequence. You had to do the editing essentially while you were making the movie. Yeah, you exactly. couldn't do it in post and, like and, and normal movies. There was movie. no way out. There was no yeah. way out. If it was, it, you know, we had to get it right on the day. Wow. 
It's amazing. Um, okay, right here. Sure. Um, Mr. Mendez, a quick question. Really like the picture. For is it, can you talk a little bit about the writing process for the first half of it? In, is it always a conscious choice to have it deserted? Because that's my favorite part of it. You're not being a big barrage of bullets and things, but being really super quiet on the front. Are you doing about the very be so there's a question about the writing of the picture. Are you doing about the very beginning of the picture. Yeah. And he also has a copy of Film Comment on his lap, so uh -oh. it means he's really super smart about movies. <laughs> <laughs> or, or it could be that he writes for film comment. Yeah. <laughs> um, the the yeah, I the music of the movie was very clear to me. I felt like it needed to come full circle. It starts with with, with Schofield leaning against the tree, it ends with him leaning against the tree. It starts with an image of kind of bucolic you know, landscape, it was peace, bird song, um, and it ends with that similar landscape. And, and I felt like, uh, you know, there's one way of expressing ha what's happened on a journey is to take a figure at the beginning and a figure at the end in an almost identical pose, and it makes you contrast everything that's happened to them in that very short space of time. So I felt that that, as a shape, was a very beautiful shape. And shape is the thing that I kept returning to, that feeling of a piece of music, you know, to be absolutely crude about it. I didn't want, you know, a slow piece is followed by a faster piece, you know. Um, the, the movie needed to breathe in and breathe out and have its own rhythm. Um, but also, I was very struck that when you research this, the First World War, you know, it's very, very compressed. The, f the field of conflict was very, very narrow. You know, people, millions of people lost their lives in one strip of land, which was no man's land. Um, you know, in, in, some <coughs> in some cases, like the Somme, I think it's 900,000 people in a day, you know, it, it unimaginable. And, and so, and yet, uh, even though it was a war, it was the beginning of industrial warfare, it was the beginning of the first war with tanks, the first war with machine guns, um, it was also, uh, there was no, no commensurate development in communication. In other words, you could shoot a man at 1,000 yards with a machine gun, but you couldn't speak to a man 20 yards away because there was no way of communicating. So it's a sort of perfect storm of horror, in a way. And what I, w what I was very struck by when you read the first-person accounts on which most of the screenplay was based was the degree to which people did not know what was happening 200 yards away. 200 yards is as good as 200 miles in the First World War. They just didn't know. You, you couldn't get any messages. And this is a movie about someone carrying a message into an, the unknown. Therefore... You, you can't know what's around the next corner. The movie depends on it. It's almost, uh, um, it's, it's a, almost a horror movie trope. You know, you, you know that you don't, you don't want to go around that next corner. You're terrified what you're going to find, but you know you have to. So that tension is constantly there. Um, but, you know, th there's, there was a... We, we did a lot of, uh, you, you know, the, our prep was we had a lot of um, uh, uh, photographs in the first world, original photographs, and one of the ones that Roger Deakins and I were most obsessed with was uh, there were three lads that were sitting around a um, uh, a picnic rug. They were having a lunch, and about I don't know, thirty yards away was a small pile of bodies. And and it wasn't that they were being disrespectful; it was just normal for them. It, it, they the, the the sense in which they sat next to de the dead, they lived hand in hand with the dead, and that those two things were very close. I was very struck by the fact that people were having baths and eating, uh, you know, in, f in fields with cornflowers in the spring of 1917, and 200 yards away were piles of unburied men, piles of them, none of whom, uh, you, you know, found graves. A and so that's, that, I suppose, was what I was trying to find a way to express. Um, you know, it's, it's um, the, you know, everyone had a similar experience. I mean, Dean discovered he had a relative in the war, you should say about your, your great-grandfather, you know, because it's really interesting. Yeah, I, uh, I read a book called The Western Front Diaries, which is uh, snippets of diary entries uh, of the soldiers who fought in the war. And as Sam said, I found out that my great-great-grandfather, David Henry Pierce, had a diary entry in that book. Wow. And uh, he talked <laughs> about, yeah, he talked about how he fought in the cavalry. Uh, he was shot when he was out in no man's land one day and was instantly paralysed and was basically bleeding out for four days trying to survive in no man's land. Uh, wow. Long story short, he survived the war and he worked in the first poppy factory that opened in Richmond in London until he died. I probably wouldn't have 
found that out, and you know, unless I had the opportunity to ask and look into the First World War, so I'm very thankful that I did. It's, am it's amazing. It's a, it's a remarkable film. Today, Roger Deakins was nominated for the ASC uh, <laughs> Award, Cinematographer, very important award. Uh, this is being nominated right and left. Thank you so much, guys, for coming out here and sharing the secrets behind 1917. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>